This G, so it's a linear transformation, but it's represented by a matrix. The matrix just comes from looking at the coefficients in our original set of equations. So, okay, so the way I've writing it down, we get something like that. Let's spread it out a bit. That corresponds to our, the first equation we had before, so maybe I can if we go back here. Okay, so if you look at this first equation, um, the coefficients here give you the rows of this matrix. <coughs> what about J? Well, the J thing, here it's going to be a sort of six by six matrix. It's made up of so two blocks down the diagonal. Um, <coughs> This, this bit is a matrix for this, this J. And then, okay, the other thing we had was the adjoint. So that, that's represented by the transpose of this matrix. So that looks like 2, 1, 0. And I'll leave you, okay, so now you can easily multiply these matrices out. They're kind of in, in blocks like this. Um, and if you do this matrix product, um, <coughs> this is identically zero. So you get a two by two matrix, which looks like this. And that's what you get in general from these Neumann and Zagier um, combinatorics conditions. Okay. And I guess you might also like to just, you know, write down the volume function explicitly in this case and see how these other equations that I wrote down work out. Okay. But yeah, so th this actually proves that um, if you maximize volume, we're actually getting a hyperbolic structure with no translations along the edges. You can do a similar kind of check to show that the, completion, the completeness conditions are satisfied. That uses some more sort of combinatorics from Neumann and Zagier. And, and that's the basic idea um, for this, this theorem. Okay. Yes, again, it's a good, if you might like to try playing around see how these completeness conditions work in this example. Um, okay. So finally, at this stage, there was a few comments. Okay, so what, what do you get out from this sort of argument? Well, one of the things you get is a kind of version of rigidity. Um, if you start off with an ideal triangulation, and we get a positively oriented solution, then this, this volume maximization argument shows there's actually a unique solution giving the maximum volume. So there's actually a unique solution giving you the complete hyperbolic structure. So th this is kind of a weak version of Mostar rigidity, but you get it very directly from the concavity of this volume function in this case. So that's the first comment. The other thing, okay, there's also a kind of converse to this. So we showed um, critical point of volume in the angle structure space gives you a complete hyperbolic structure. Um, the converse is also true. So if you have an angle structure which gives you the complete hyperbolic structure, then that, that has to be a critical point of volume. So this is basically, yeah, so there's an if and only if statement here. The other thing, there's also a version of this which works for Dane filling. Um, it's just a slight variation on what we've been doing. If you remember, if 
we're working with an ideal triangulation, you can find um, hyperbolic structures for Dane filling by first solving our edge equations, but then you get an extra kind of holonomy equation, which says basically you see an angle of 2 pi if you go around the PQ curve on the boundary torus. Now, so that's looking at the, basically the holonomy of the PQ curve on the, the boundary torus. Now that, that's condition, again, it's got to have two parts. So you can think of it as saying um, there's a rotation by 2 pi plus zero translations along there. Now if you just look at the kind of rotational part of the polynomy and forget about possible translations, again you get a set of linear equations. And you can add those to the previous linear equations we had for the edge conditions. Again, there's a kind of linear programming problem. And if you, so this gives you a subspace of the angle structure space where the kind of rotational part of the holonomy is 2 pi for the surgery curve. And again, same kind of argument shows if you maximize volume on that subset, um, that will give you the hyperbolic structure for the Dane filling. So there's a version of this that works for Dane fillings as well. And I guess that, that was written down in, I guess it was a fourth year project by Ken Chan, who was working with me at, at Melbourne. Okay. All right. So I think so that's what I'd like to say. So this is one approach um, to finding hyperbolic structures, starting with angle structures and doing this volume maximization procedure. The hope is that, okay, so maybe if you can always find a suitable triangulation to start with, you can use this kind of method to show that certain triangulations are geometric. So as I mentioned, this has been done for some nice examples like um, punctured torus bundles and um, two bridge knot complements. But there's also lots of other cases where you can, this procedure may work. And that will start giving us some more information about the connections between the sort of combinatorics or topology of your manifold and the geometry. Okay. So I think to finish up in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I just wanted to mention a few more open problems. So I guess the first problem that we've been kind of looking at today is the following. Um, we'd like to find topological conditions on an ideal triangulation um, that guarantee it's actually a geometric triangulation for some hyperbolic metric. So, we, so just starting from topological or combinatorial conditions, can we guarantee the existence of a hyperbolic structure with all tetrahedra positively oriented. Um, it would be just as good for computational purposes to allow for like flat tetrahedra as well. And this is kind of a really interesting sort of topological question. So if you start with any old triangulation, can you modify it in some systematic way to get to a good triangulation, which will satisfy this? Um, if you have a cusp hyperbolic three manifold, the canonical cell decomposition gives you this kind of thing, possibly with flat tetrahedra. But, but we'd like to be able to do this without knowing the hyperbolic structure to start with, just starting from a you know, combinatorial description of the manifold. So one condition you might try to add is, what if you take a tetrahedron with the smallest possible number of tetrahedra? So a so-called minimal triangulation. Um, you'd hope that by sort of reducing the number of te tetrahedra, um, the geometry kind of should get better. And so this, if you've got fewer tetrahedra, there's more hope of getting kind of positively oriented tetrahedra. Um, it's not clear that minimal triangulations will always work here. Um, I think there may be examples, I think, where the minimal, tri minimal triangulation is not necessarily positively oriented. Um, 
but in that case, that, that suggests, okay, we need to come up with extra conditions. And, and there's various other kind of nice combinatorial conditions you could look at. Um, for instance, J. Karen Rubenstein have been looking at so-called efficient triangulations. Um, they have sort of extra nice properties. Um, they kind of basically they rule out, if you look at normal surfaces, Things like normal spheres and normal tori are very restricted. Basically, there's only kind of trivial um, normal two spheres and tori in these efficient triangulations. So you might ask, is that enough? Again, it, it's not known, but again, it may not be enough, I think, in general. Um, so you need to kind of find extra conditions to really guarantee geometric solution. So this, this looks like a looks like a hard problem, but it's a very interesting problem. And if, if you could solve this, this would probably lead to a f nice efficient algorithms, that are provable, you know, pr you know, rigorous algorithms for computing hyperbolic structures. Okay. So I guess the next question, okay, so this is not really related to what I was talking about today, but it's, it's related to something that's been one of the main sort of themes in this workshop, and that's the idea of commensurability for three manifolds, or for hyperbolic manifolds. So <coughs> remember, so two hyperbolic manifolds are commensurable if they have finite sheeted coverings which, are, which agree, which are the same. And we've seen so the question is, how can you tell if you're given two hyperbolic manifolds or orbifolds, can you decide whether or not they're commensurable? Now we've seen number theory gives you lots of important invariants here. Things like the invariant trace field and quaternion algebra. These are all very powerful invariants. Now I guess in the arithmetic case, so in Alan's favorite case, this is a um, complete set of invariants. So what we can do is use, we can use SNAP to complete these things. If you know the manifolds are both arithmetic, that tells you whether or not they're commensurable. But if in the non-arithmetic case, and that's actually the typical case, that's the kind of generic case, um, these are not enough, not enough information. And, and there's other sort of arithmetic invariants that you can start looking at. Um, Things like traces of group elements give you more information. Um, but um, again, we don't know a kind of complete list of invariants like this in the non-arithmetic case. Now it turns out in the cusp case, for cusp hyperbolic manifolds, <coughs> things are better and there is a nice algorithm which will decide whether or not two hyperbolic manifolds are commensurable. And this goes back again to the idea of canonical cell decompositions. Let's see, so roughly speaking, um, okay, so I have talked, haven't said much about this, but if you're given, a, say, a, a cusp hyperbolic manifold, what you can do is the following. Um, you start with a sort of standard horosphere cross-section at each cusp. Well, you could take, um, say, a, a, one of these horospherical tori cross-section to each of the cusps. And, and that's, that bounds a kind of neighborhood, a horrible neighborhood of the cusp. Um, if you lift these to the universal cover, what you see is a whole lot of horospheres or horribles sitting in the universal cover, which is hyperbolic space. Um, the idea is to divide the whole space up into regions where each point is associated with the nearest horrible. So it's like the idea of Dirichlet domains that I guess I think Su Young talked about the other day. Um, so if you're given a discrete group, you take a point, you take the orbit of that point under the group, you divide the space up into regions where each point is associated, well you take each point to the, have a region as, <coughs> consisting of points closest to one of the points in one of the orbits. So around each point you get a region. This is a Dirichlet domain. Due to that there's a kind of um, cell decomposition or triangulation of your manifold. Now you can do the same kind of thing for these cusp manifolds. 
You start with this collection of horror balls in the universal cover. You divide the universal cover up into regions, each point associated with the closest horror ball. Um, the boundary of these regions is some kind of two complex, often called the Ford two complex. And, and dual to that, you have a kind of cell, canonical cell, de, we have a cell decomposition. Would you mind drawing something? Uh, yeah, I think. Um, <laughs> not sure we have enough time, but okay, I'll just. I can draw the. Um, Let's see. So here's okay the 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 Dirichlet domain picture, something like this. So you start. Okay, here's a simple example in the plane. We'd, so we have a just a lattice. Okay, so we start with some point here. Um, you look at the points which are. So let's say we look at this point. We want the points which are closer to this than any other point in our lattice. So, for instance, here we get some sort of dividing um, hyperplane, or just a line. Here we get some kind of set of points equidistant from these. Here we get some points equidistant from these. Here, I can do something like this. Okay. And if you continue doing this, then we see there's some sort of nice polygon here, which are the points which are closer to this point than any other point in the orbit. So this would be a Dirichlet domain. Um, dual to this, there's a kind of triangulation. So the idea is for each edge here, you take a dual edge like this, joining two of the original points. Here you would take this, here you would take this, here you would take this, and so on. So here you end up with a triangulation, maybe it looks like this. <coughs> okay. Something like that. And this is actually, this would be kind of the dual triangulation. Um, now you have to imagine the same sort of thing in hyperbolic space. Start with a bunch of points, but now you move them out to the sphere at infinity. You do the same kind of thing, or you could take horror balls centered at the sphere at infinity. Um, not sure I want to try and draw this, but so if we work in hyperbolic space, horror balls are things like this. So if you lift the cusp in the manifold, you get these sort of things. Again, you take some kind of dividing hyperplanes. I'm not sure what it's going to look like here. I won't. Yeah, anyway, I won't try and draw it. But you can do the same kind of thing. You get these kind of bisecting hyperplanes. That gives you some sort of regions. And, and due to that, um, you get a triangulation. So you start. Things like this, for instance. So this might be. Okay, so that's the canonical triangulation. Now, okay, so finally to finish, um, what can you do? Well, the idea is you look at, um, if you're given two manifolds, two cusped hyperbolic manifolds, you choose some horrible cross sections of the cusps. You take the corresponding canonical cell decompositions and you lift them to the universal cover. And, and the basic result is that um, two, say, manifolds will be commensurable if you can find these sort of nice cell decompositions which lift to the isometric cell decompositions in the universal cover. So in the universal cover, the decompos these cell decompositions actually have to match up. And, and that's the basic idea um, you can use to test for commensurability. So finally, I guess in the closed case, we don't have a, any kind of good canonical cell decomposition. Um, 
You could do something, for instance, if you have a closed manifold and you choose a closed geodesic in there, um, there's some sort of um, nice fundamental domain based on these geodesics. But um, this doesn't necessarily behave well when you go to finite sheeted coverings. So at the moment, um, <coughs> there's one kind of naive way of, of com testing commensurability. So we know if two things are commensurable, we have to have finite index subgroups in the fundamental groups that are actually um, isomorphic or conjugate. Now, using volume bounds, lower bounds on volume, you can actually estimate the degree of these coverings. But the problem is um, the bounds we have um, would give you extremely high index covering. So, you know, typically, I don't know, for manifolds of volume two or something, you might have to go to coverings of degree 50 and you'd have to look at all possible coverings of degree 50, all possible index 50 subgroups and see if any of these match up. And, and that's just not practical. There's just too many subgroups of these sort of indices. So I think, so this is a really nice problem to try and find a practical way of doing commensurability testing for closed hyperbolic manifolds and orbifolds. And I guess, yes, I'm not sure how to do it, but maybe some more kind of arithmetic type invariance may help. Um, but I think that's another good problem. So I think I should stop there for today. And finally, here's a few references if you want to read up more about what we've been doing. So thank you very much, and that's it. Yeah. Any questions? <coughs> Great. Hi. Is there a